Welcome, everybody. Um, who of you has contributed to open source? Oh, that's nice. OK. And who of you has done this using Git? OK, that's quite the most of you. Um, <clears throat> most of the time, and that's not primarily for open source usage, um, if we're using Git, uh, we can use Git, but we can do it in a way that's not very nice. And, and what I'm trying to, to do in this talk is to, to look at the technical parts of Git, but um, from an angle of a, of a use case perspective, how to behave in the right way uh, when, I'm, when I'm using Git. But first things first, um, my name is Sebastian. Um, I'm working at Track, uh, Check24 here in Germany. I'm doing programming for roughly 30 years now. So I started with a, a C64 and some basic and moved from there. I'm doing some open source, mostly in the web PHP uh, area. And like most people, I say stupid stuff on the internet. So if you care, you can, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Anybody has seen something similar like, like this, right? Um, yeah. I'm not swearing on stage, so I'm not reading out loud what's happening here, but um, this is a commit history I see in a lot of projects. It, it doesn't help you at all uh, figuring out what's happening in your software. And, and figuring out what's happening in your software is, is quite important. Um, and it's, it's especially important for, for open source software. So the first concept uh, I want to talk about um, are atomic commits. And so what are atomic commits? So if you see a commit message like this, um, implementing new voting feature, fix an internal messaging issue, and refactored some inheritance menace. Great, right? And there's way too much going on there. Um, and that's basically not what atomic commit means. Um, an atomic commit would be much more like this, right? We would say, add voting persistent service, uh, refactor four motors to be composable, uh, fix internal messaging issue, and add voting API endpoints and actions. And this has a lot of advantages if we do it this way. Um, for one, if somebody needs this fix, he can just cherry pick this commit. If you buried this fix somehow anywhere in, this, in the commit over there, he, he's not able to get the fix. So then you start copy pasting stuff and, and sending patches and yeah, it's getting really messy. But if you, if you do it in an atomic way, um, you can just push it upstream and somebody can cherry pick your fix. Uh, and that's, that's quite nice. Another thing is, and that's where it's uh, becoming important for, um, uh, for the development process, um, if you're doing pull requests or code reviews. So who's doing pull requests or code reviews on a regular basis? Yeah, nice. OK, cool. Um, so especially if you contribute stuff in open source, you're doing pull requests. And somebody has to figure out what you've done and has to um, understand what you've done with the software. And imagine uh, one commit. So you see a pull request like this. There's one commit, 17 files changed, and that's not very big, right? So it's, it's still small. But if you look at the pull request and you see 17 files changed, you have no idea where to start. Right? It's, it's becoming this big mess. And like I said, 17 files is really small. And even that's horrible to, to, to review. Right? So if you like, have 50 files change or 80, it's, it's a total disaster. What happens if you do this in an atomic way and doing atomic commits, you still have, in the end, 80 files changed. But you have these anchor points 
of your of your thinking process where you can say okay i first did this and then i did that and then i did something else and what somebody can do is he can click on every commit and can watch or or can check the files that changed for each commit and then he can follow your thinking process much easier he can say oh okay that's what he did to change the persistence layer okay that's totally clear because he had to add some uh, data access objects and that's that's totally fine for me okay that's five files and then you go to the next commit and see okay he added some api endpoints okay therefore you should add some controllers and actions okay next six files check done right so it's it's much easier if you if you keep the commits and and do very small commits um and of course master uwe has some rules for atomic commits um, atomic commits are a single irreducible but useful set of changes. And that's very important, the useful. Because I, what I hear often is, yeah, I, lo I read this blog post and they said commit often, commit always. Um, and that's right. But then your commit history is like, uh, a safe game in a computer game, right? It's quick save, quick load, quick save, quick, quick load. And none of your quick saves matter for me. So it, it doesn't really have has anything uh, meaningful in it. So you can do this, but in the end, if you submit the pull request or uh, uh, get to the point where you get a code review, please clean up that mess and create single uh, useful uh, set of changes. Next one uh, is everything works. And that's, that's really, really important. You can commit as much crap as you want. Um, please, if you submit a pull request, make it that every commit is deployable to production. So I can choose any commit in the commit history and deploy it to production. Um, that makes it much easier uh, for everybody to, to work with, with the software. Because everybody knows I can use any ch uh, set or any commit uh, in my history and deploy it to production, and it should work. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to work um, in, your, uh, in your daily work, so you can commit. But before you submit uh, a pull request or stuff like that, you can clean that up. And I will show you in a second how it's done. Mm. And a rule of thumb is don't use the AND word in commit messages, right? So if there's an AND, then it's already too much. So don't do that. And so when I'm talking about commit messages, I was really relieved that uh, the previous speaker didn't go into detail about commit messages because, um, uh, yeah, then this would be kind of, uh, uh, yeah, irrelevant now, but who knows this website, whatthecommit.com. Okay, not so many, that's nice. So if you ever need for a cool, handy commit message, right, and you don't know what to do, what to do uh, you go, just go to whatthecommit.com and you get some gems like major fix-up, uh, fixed tupio, <laughs> one that not simply merge into master, and uh, one of my absolute favorites is best commit ever. <laughs> so, obviously, those are fun, but as we've seen before, they are not very useful. So, um, once again, Master Uwe has some some rules for us how we uh, should should do commit messages, and the first one is. Uh, separate the, uh, the the subject and the body with a blank line. And when I tell people this, they look at me funny and say, a uh, commit message body doesn't have a commit message, only four words or something like that. Um, yeah, we will see an example later. Limits the subject to 50 characters. That's We will see why this is a, a bit of important in a second. Um, don't end the subject with a period. Um, yeah, this is more arbitrary, but... Um, so since we're limiting us to 15 characters, every character counts, so don't waste it for a point or for a period. Um, next one, uh, capitalize the subject line. And that's, yeah, it's kind of the same. Um, I'm 
kind of a strange person. If I see a Git history and they, the first word starting with uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, lowercase, then it cringes me out. But that's, I'm special in that way. So um, I always try to uh, bring people to the point where I can see, OK, yeah, just capitalize them. Um, and that's a little bit more important. Use the imperative mood for commit messages. And the imperative mood is, um, it's, is, is the form where I say it's do it. So it's not I fixed issue number 500 or something like this. Um, it's fix issue. Um, and we see a, a, a good examples in, in a second. Next one is uh, wrap the body at 72 uh, characters. And that's mostly for terminal nerds like me uh, that are not using any GUI tools. Uh, we are very happy if uh, we don't have to side scroll uh, for your commit messages. And last one is uh, use the body to explain what and why versus how. Because how you did something, the code is telling me that. I know how you achieved your, your changes, but I don't know why you did it and what was the intent of, of that, that change. So maybe you ever come across a situation where, you, where somebody asks you, hey, why did we change that? And you say, I don't know. The commit message says we, we change it. Yeah, but, but why it's, it's a completely different thing. So uh, it's quite nice to keep track of stuff like that in, uh, in commit messages. But let's uh, go back to the subject line. So if you have a commit message um, and it's longer than 50 characters, most tools like uh, GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket um, are shortening uh, your, your uh, commit message. And most of the time when I see this, it's, OK, yaddy, 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 and the important thing is dot, 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 oh, crap. Like, <laughs> Right? The, the important stuff is always hidden behind the dots, so I always have to, uh, to click. Um, so yeah, just keep the very important stuff uh, in, in 50 characters. Um, then we said use the imperative mood. Uh, and it's, we're just following the example of Git, because Git is doing exactly that. It's, it's not saying we are merging branch my feature, it says merge branch. So um, we should always uh, do as uh, uh, Git uh, does. So, um, and there's a, there's a good uh, rule of thumb. You can use this sentence. If applied, this commit will, and then use, the, uh, uh, use your commit uh, message title or subject. Um, and it, we have, if you have some, some bad examples, so if applied, this commit will fixed bug. OK, that sounds strange. And the good example is this commit will merge branch feature X. This commit will update the getting started documentation. This will, this will. Uh, and it's, in the beginning, it's, it's awkward to write commit messages like this. At least it was for me. Um, but you get. Commit messages get very precise if you're using the imperative mode. So I can only encourage you to, to do that. And a complete example um, could, uh, could look like this. Um, you have the subject, then the blank line, and the body. right? And of course, yes, not, not every commit message has to look this way. right? But especially if you... Um, if you keep atomic commits, and if you merge into master and you squish all your atomic commits together, then the, the merge commit should look like this. It should be uh, a real, really combination of all the commit messages uh, that were squished together. Mm. <coughs> Have you ever seen some stuff like that? In your, uh, in your project, so your GUI tool, GUI tool, and you want to look what's happening in your branches, and uh, you're looking at the Git graph, and at that point, it's no longer a Git graph, it's like a Git hero thing. 
Um, and yeah, uh, so Master Uge has something to sell, tell about that. So he says, your mind is like the Git graph, my friend. When it is agitated, it becomes difficult to see. Uh, but if you allow it to settle, uh, the answer becomes clear. Um, and what that means is, if you have a Git graph like that, and you can get to it very, very easily, um, you, it's, it's totally useless. You know, it, it doesn't help you anymore. And the Git graph can be very, very useful. Um, but for that, you have to follow some, uh, some, some guidelines. So why is your Git graph messed up like this? And it's messed up because you're doing merges. And if you're doing merges, Git always keeps track of something where it came from and where, where it's going. And if, if you merge a lot, then your Git graph becomes like, uh, yeah, like this Guitar Hero thing. Um, so merging is safe. Uh, it's the safest way to, to, uh, to get stuff together. Um, but it messes up the, the history a bit, right? Um, so why is that? So if we look at uh, a git merge, say we have a feature branch. And if nothing changes, um, we can do this fast forward merge, right? So it's, we just get our, get our uh, new commits in, and everything's fine. But if we have something happening in the master branch in the meantime, then Git has to kind of, yeah, I have to get, do, do some guesswork here, right? So I'm guessing, oh, this should work, but just to be sure, I'm creating this merge commit. And this merge commit is actually uh, really, really handy because, as I said, this is kind of guesswork what Git is doing, and it's really good in it, um, but it still can cause problems. And this merge commit is handy in a way that you can, if you are undoing this merge commit, then the red ones are gone as well. So if you undo the merge, all commits that you merged with this merge are gone as well. So it's very easy to undo merges. But how can we do this in a, in a nicer way, right? So since merge commits and mergers are kind of messing up our history, so what can we do? Um, and the, the, the answer to this is rebasing. And who of you is rebasing on a regular basis, like daily? OK. <laughs> Git pull dash dash rebase, right? OK. Um, what rebasing does is it actually, um, and I heard a lot of people saying, no, 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 we did rebase once, and ah, it was a disaster. Everything went to shits, right? Um, and why was that? Because what Git is doing is it just, it's not throwing your commits away, but it's just removing your commits and storing them somewhere, and then it's, it's getting the latest changes, and then it's, it's reapplying your commits. And it is, it is subtle in the, uh, in the slides, but as you can see, the, the color has, uh, has changed. For before, the commits were red, and now the dots are purple. And that's because it's, uh, those are completely new commits. So what you've done is you've changed the history. And that's the dangerous stuff in, in Git, right? So we. And that's why everybody's talking about never rebase master or never rebase shared branches and stuff like this. Because what, you, what you're creating when, you, when you're pushing or force pushing this, um, you, you can create a, lot of, uh, a big mess for, for other people uh, with, with that code. But in our situation, this now is really nice because for Git now, it is that we started uh, at this point. Our, we started our work at this point, and now we can again create this uh, this fast forward merge. And we don't have a merge commit, and that's uh, that's quite nice. Cool. So now we have a very clean history, but this causes a problem. So now 
if we want to undo the merge, we, are, we have no idea how many commits we merged, right? So now it's easy because, okay, the, we have the two purple ones, but what if you merged like 30 commits or something like this? You have no idea how much you really merged, and if you want to undo it, you have to turn uh, go back like 29 commits, or whether it's 30, or whether it's 31, and it's always one, one too much, or, or, or uh, so it, you, you are not doing this, uh, you cannot make this right. So what we are doing is, um, we still are merging, but what we are doing now is, we are forcing Git to create a merge commit. And now you're saying, okay, Sebastian, but you said merge commits are bad. Yes, um, if you're doing merges all over the place, but if you're doing it this way, uh, what you're ending up with is something like this. And this is really, really nice. You have a, a clean history, and you always branch, and then return to the master. So this is your, this is your master, right? And you always can see, okay, we did this feature, uh, the, we did the green feature, then we did the blue bug fix, and then the purple feature, and stuff like that. And if you, if you mess up the integration, you can just undo the merge commit, and all the commits that came with that merge are gone. Um, so if you have... Um, so I always say start with the simplest workflow or Git workflow uh, you can if you start developing a project. And this is quite simple, I would say. Um, but now your Git graph is very useful. You can see what's happening in your project, right? Um, it, it will always stay only two lines. It's never going wider than two lines if you, uh, if you are doing this. Um, mm, you can do uh, some funny stuff. <laughs> um, you don't have to read this, but um, we will talk in the, uh, a bit about Git alias a bit more in a second. But what you can do is you can create uh, aliases that support your workflow in Git. Um, so this is a Git alias that I called integrate. And what it does is it tries to merge a branch, but it um, it checks if it can fast forward merge it, and if so, it uh, merges it with a merge commit, and if it can't merge it fast forward, it will say, no, no, you have to rebase uh, the, uh, the branch first. So uh, this is a really nice way of uh, helping you doing that stuff that seems a little bit more complicated in the first place. But as I, I said, rebasing can be dangerous, and you sh should remember that please please don't do it on shared branches. Um, so if you're working on your feature branch and uh, you're working on it completely alone, it's com completely fine. You can rebase however you want it. But um, as soon as somebody um, else is working on that code, um, please don't just rebase. Um, if you have to, um, please talk to the person that, or to the people that are using the, uh, this branch as well. And if you have a workflow um, where you create branches of branches, don't ever rebase, because um, you have no idea if somebody is using your branch to create another branch, and if you rebase that, that's totally horrible for everybody who who branched off of your branch. That's, uh, so a rule of thumb, please don't create branches or feature branches. So if, if ever possible, don't, don't do that. Um, so what does uh, the good students do? The good, um, we write commit messages that are precise uh, and informative. And we create a mess. Uh, by committing often, but before we, um, before we create pull requests or uh, go to a code review, uh, we, we clean it up. And so how do we clean it up? So um, the people who are using uh, Rebase on, on a daily basis uh, already know. So um, 
we're starting with git rebase-i for the interactive rebase. And what that does is it shows us a list of commits that we did in, uh, in our development process. And now we have, as you can see, we have four commits in here. And git is very nice. It's already uh, giving us some options and it's telling us uh, what, we, uh, what we can do with, with those commits. And for example, um, we can just um, move the line and say, OK, um, this fixed typo belongs to the superhero fighting skills. It wasn't a typo for the uh, public API. It was a typo in the fighting skills. So we move it up. And what we can do now is we can say, oh, OK, I don't want anybody to know that I'm a bad typer. So this fixed typo commit, it should disappear. Nobody needs to know that. So what we can do is we can uh, change pick to fix up here. And what that will do is it will combine the second and now the third commit together. So the changes will be combined, but the, the commit message uh, will, will uh, the fixed typo commit message is gone. So that's fix up. Um, and you can squash commits. That's quite that's the same thing. Um, but now Git will ask you what kind of commit message you want to, uh, you want to use or, and give you the ability to edit the commit message again. Um, you can go crazy and do uh, use edit. Uh, then the rebase will stop, and you can uh, go back to the terminal, add files, or do more changes, and really edit the commit. Um, but in, in the most cases, you're really fine with changing the order and doing fix-ups or squashes. Um, and that's most of the time the only thing you have to do. Right, combining stuff and changing the order um, to make it to make it understandable and clean. So we save, um, and now uh, the rebase uh, went went through. And if we look at uh, our Git log, now we can see that the uh, fixed typo commit is gone. Right, and nobody will ever know that you mistyped. That's uh, that's really nice, and. It's not only that nobody knows that you don't, don't type very good. They all, it, it's, it's useless information for everybody out there. So nobody cares that, the f that you fix the typo. So they, they, yeah, of course they care, but uh, it's, it's not very useful information. And it's not helping them in any way to understand what's happening in your repository. So you can easily get rid of those uh, commits. And, now we have this problem since I've said, OK, if we do a rebase, um, so what we're doing is we're creating new commits, right? So we throw commits away, and we're creating new, new ones. And especially if you squash them, or maybe you, um, you accidentally said you don't need that commit at all, and that was a mistake. Um, so now you're, you're in, the, in a state where you can say, OK, that's not really good because it's gone, right? And that's where, the, uh, where you normally uh, do a, uh, a M -M dash RF and remove the repository and clone it again and do all your day's work again. Um, yeah. Uh, no more because uh, there's uh, the ref lock. Reflog to the rescue. What the reflog is, uh, is giving you is, if you execute give reflog command, um, the reflog is actually um, um, a more detailed history. You don't only have the commits as a history. Uh, the the reflog has a much more detailed history. And uh, as you can see in this example, we have like uh, when we we have a, a lock entry where we started the rebase, and then we have a um, we have a lock entry where we did this fix up thing and combined two commits, and even one where everything uh, uh, where the where the rebase is done, and we can now go back to each of those states, right? We can say okay, we can completely go back before our rebase, and then everything's is back to the state uh, where, um, where we started rebasing. Um, so if you completely mess up, uh, it's not a problem. Uh, the reflog can, uh, can help you. So what you do is 
you just say, okay, I want to go to this position of the ref lock. In our case, it's head four, headed four. Um, and then you're back at that state, right? And you, in our case, I think that's uh, before we started the rebase. So you, you can retry to rebase it in a, uh, the right way uh, in this case, right? <coughs> and now that we rebased and made everything clean and nice, um, of course we have to force push, right? Um, and that's scary because we can uh, do a lot of harm with, with force pushing. Mm, and that's beca um, because there's uh, force uh, with lease. And what that's doing, uh, it, it gives you um, a, a small safety net. Because if you're pushing with uh, force with lease, it will not override commits in a central repository that you, ha that you don't know of. So if somebody changed your branch in the meantime while you were rebasing, then in the central repository there's a commit that you don't know of. And then Git will tell you and say, no, no, you can't force push because somebody changed the repository already. Um, you have to do something differently now, right? So uh, you have to rebase again or whatever, right? Um, this prevents uh, a lot of uh, angry uh, colleagues coming after you with pitches and forks and uh, yeah, throwing stuff at you. So that's basically the, um, the behavioral part. Right, how we should behave, and now to get some to make this all a little bit easier, um, uh, I want to share some uh, some tips and tricks you can use uh, to make it uh, um, the Git handling a little bit more easy. And one of the first things um, I do uh, when I configure a new machine is uh, I set up my Git aliases, and you can do a lot of uh, crazy stuff with git aliases. Um, for example, like, yeah, I, I already told you I'm not good at typing, so I'm, most of the time, I'm using one character commands, like uh, git, git p for pull, git c for commit, or git b for branch. Like, yeah. You have no idea uh, how much I mistyped git status. So <laughs> I'm doing Git workshops as well, so uh, it's always funny. And then I'm not using my aliases because that would be kind of weird for everybody uh, if I only type GS or something like that. Um, but um, if we would make a drinking game, whenever I mistype status, uh, uh, we won't come get out of the workshop alive. So um, yeah. Just remember, don't get too crazy with Git aliases because maybe you have to help somebody else uh, with the Git problem, and most of the time they don't have your aliases. So uh, yeah, but like um, there are cool aliases to um, go to your uh, on the terminal, go to your repository root. Um, it's most of the time I'm using uh, Git gr for Git uh, root. And then you go always to the repository root. And that's really nice uh, aliases, or the integrate alias. So I don't have do, to do uh, two or three git commands uh, in a row. Uh, I only uh, execute one, one thing, and uh, we're, we're fine. Um, a lot of um, people say to me, yeah, um, but I'm, I really like uh, the GUI thing because I can see the log and it's, it's really nice and it has colors and I see some lines and stuff like that. Um, Git log is really, really powerful on the terminal. Um, and you can, uh, you can do really cool things with Git log on the terminal. Um, there are a lot of options you can use, um, like before or after. Uh, you can get uh, commits from spe specific authors. Um, you can check files that changed and stuff like that. And of course, uh, you can 
use crazy aliases for uh, for your git log. Uh, for example, that's an alias I use. Uh, it's git l. Um, and what that does is um, it renders out a really nice log on the terminal. What you can do is you can color code everything uh, and configure what kind of hashes you want to see and stuff like that. Um, and <coughs> in this case, um, I'm, I'm also using dash dash graph uh, on the terminal. And as you can see, um, you can see the, the git graph on the, first, uh, on the left side there. And if you are following the guideline that you only have like feature branch, master branch, feature branch, master branch, it's completely handleable uh, on the terminal. If you have like this Guitar Hero thing, uh, it's uh, it's not very useful on the on the terminal. Um, another thing you can can do with uh, Git log is you can search in it, um, like with the regular less uh, commands, uh, you can just type slash and your search term, and use n and uppercase n to the next or previous uh, finding that you, that you searched. Um, that's really handy. Uh, and most of the time, that's much more difficult to do in, in a GUI tool than uh, on a terminal. Next up is git stash. Mm. Anybody used git stash before? Well, that's quite a lot. OK. Um, so git stash is mm, to, uh, if you want to, most of the time if you say, OK, I want to get the up, uh, upstream changes, so I want to do git pull, and git is telling you, yeah, I can't do it because you, you did some changes over there, uh, and I don't know what to do with it. Please commit or stash. So what it, what it means is git is telling you, yeah, you have some changes, and the upstream has changes as well, and I don't know how to put those together. Um, and now, obviously, you can commit them and let git do the merge stuff, but you're not quite happy with that, the chain, the, uh, those changes, and you don't want them commit to, uh, to commit them right now. So what you can do is you can stash them. And what stash does is it moves your changes away in some magical place. Um, so you can type git stash. Um, and then uh, your changes are gone, right? They are vanished uh, happily in the stash. Um, what you can do now is you can say, OK, let's see what's in my stash. And now we have uh, an object in our stash. And we can now get our changes back. So with git stash pop, for example, uh, we can get our uh, changes back, uh, execute git status, and now uh, our changes are back. So what we can do, we can stash them, we can pull changes from upstream, and then get our changes back from the stash. Um, so we can git stash pop. What that is doing is it removes the item from the stash and applies the changes. Um, but you can also use git stash apply, and if you have multiple changes in your stash, you can pick uh, the stash uh, you want to to apply them, and you can of course uh, drop certain things from your stash and clean up this uh, the stash. But that's very useful. For example, if you have an application where um, you, if you want to debug the application, you have to like change three places. You have to change some config value, and you have to uh, add some special parameters to it, and and yeah, multiple uh, changes. Um, what you can do is you can add these changes or make these changes and then git stash them. And whenever you want to debug, you can just apply that stash and then these multiple changes are done in your, in your application. You can debug and then you can run git stash again and you can, uh, or git reset and remove the changes again. But whenever you need them, you can get them from your, from your stash. So that's uh, quite handy. <coughs> A lot of uh, IDEs are, are stashing on default. So if you're executing update in, in uh, JetBrains IDE, what they are doing, if you have changes, they stash your changes, update, and then reapply your, uh, your changes. And since the IT, uh, idea, uh, JetBrains IDE does that automatically, sometimes you can end up with some weird git state. 
like, okay, I want to reapply the stash, but it can't because we have conflicts now, and yeah, and that's what what's happening there. So then you have to, you can try to figure it out. <coughs> um, a really nice thing about the atomic commits uh, I was talking about earlier is um, if something bad happens, like. So we are in our Zen mode, right? We are developing and kicking, uh, kicking features out, and somebody comes along and says, Oof, here's, here's something bad happens, right? And it's terrible enough that the bad thing happened, and we, uh, we can somehow fix it. Um, but now the business is telling us, OK, we have to know since when this problem exists, right? So. We had some customer stuff that was not uh, that that wasn't working right, and we have to know how many customers we have to contact. We have to know exactly since when this issue is in our code base, or uh, when when it when it went to production. So, what we can do is um, we have to investigate uh, our complete history and have to figure out when this issue. Uh, got introduced in our code base. So, as we all know, um, so the business is coming saying, okay, we know it wasn't, it was working all right like two months before, right? So we have some point in time where we know this was working. And now we have to figure out where the problem uh, was introduced in our code base. So, um, what we would do is, uh, we would do the, the binary search, and we go in somewhere into the middle, and would check, okay, is this working? No, it's here. It's bad, right? And then, okay, science must be somewhere over there. Uh, okay, this is working, so it can be either this one. No, no, this is working, so this is the back commit, right? And of course, we can do that manually, but the cool thing is, uh, Git has a tool for that, and that's called Git bisect. And what we can do is we can say, okay, we want to start uh, a bisect, and so we uh, type git bisect start. And then we have to do th two things. We have to say to git, uh, this is the stuff where everything worked, and this is the point in time where it, it didn't work. So in, in, our uh, in our example, the current state, the head state, is not working. So what we're doing is we say git bisect bad, and say, okay, the head state is not working. And then we say, okay, git bisect good, and we saw no, like, in release version 2. Point whatever, uh, it was good, and we are getting the commit hash, and we're saying, yeah, this, um, this was good. What git is doing now, it's exactly doing what, what it was showing for before on the slide, right? It's going to the middle. Um, and then we check it, we say, no, this is still bad, and it git checks out the stuff, and then we s can we just say, okay, no, we can test it, and then can say, oh, mm, okay, that wa this one is good, and then after a while, git will tell you, okay, this one was the commit that made everything burn in this example, right? Um, <coughs> and Here's the, the advantage of um, doing atomic commits. If you're doing small commits, the change set that you did in this commit should be very small. And then you can easily find the problem that caused the issue, right? Um, so now what we have to do, we type git bisect reset. We want to end our, uh, our, our bisect run. And then um, we are back to the point where we started in our current head state. And that's quite nice, because we don't have to check out all that stuff manually, but we still have to check our software manually. So we still have to do all that stuff and make, uh, check if our application works. And the cool thing is, if we have unit tests, um, we can say, OK, um, we do a bisect, and we do the same stuff. And Git will check out the, the same uh, commit as before. But what we can do now is we can say, OK, um, let's run our unit tests. And then Git will automatically 
validate the, the return value of our unit tests. And so if our unit tests pass, uh, the commit will be uh, marked as good. And if the unit tests fail, the commit will be marked as bad. So it automatically checks out all our revisions and will run the unit tests and then will automatically determine the commit that did the bad stuff. Right? So you don't have to do anything. You can say bisect, unit tests, go for a coffee, and then come back and let Git tell you uh, where the bad stuff happens in your software. So that's, uh, that's really, really nice. And that's one more example of why uh, you should um, make sure that every commit works. Because if you have a commit in your history, then you, maybe you have a syntax error or something like this, or it couldn't even compile, right? Then this wouldn't work at all because it will always fail because you can't execute the unit tests if, you're, uh, if you can't compile your application or if you have some other stuff that's, that's not working there. So that's all from me. Thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, with git bisect run, run, do you have a, a good strategy to uh, run a new unit test against all the old uh, commits? Yes. Um, what you have to do is, um, so if you find a bug, normally there's no unit test for it, right? Because otherwise you would have found the bug uh, much earlier. What you can't do is, you can't write the unit test into a into a file that's already in your repository, because if you commit it and you check out an older version, the unit test isn't there. So what you have to do is you have to write the unit test in a completely new file that's not in your repository and just leave it there. The, the unit tool should recognize that file and Git shouldn't care about the file that's not in the repository. And if you found the bad commit, you can then move that unit test into the right file and commit it. So this, it, it's, yeah, you have, to, you have to work around that you can't change a file that's in your Git repository. So if it's a new unit test, you have to create a file that's not in your repository. But that works. What exactly does Git run when you do Git run unit tests? So what it does is it's, um, it's executing the binary and it's evaluating the return value of that binary. So it, the exit code, right? So if, in, if a Unix command is successful, it normally returns zero. And if it's not successful, it's returning an exit code higher than zero, like one or whatever. And what git bisect run is doing, it's evaluating this exit code. And if the exit code is zero, it will say, okay, it, everything worked, so it, it should be a good commit. And if the exit code of the command you run is higher zero, not zero, then it will mark the commit as bad. So you can create, you don't have to do unit tests, you can just write a script, um, whatever you want, in your programming language, in bash or whatever, that uh, creates an exit code for the failure uh, um, scenario and uh, a exit code of zero if everything's fine. So uh, that's another easy way to find the issue if you don't have unit tests. Just write a script that simulates the issue and then you, you're fine. What would I do if I have spent two days bisecting the Linux kernel and end up in a 3000 line merge commit? Is this game over or? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, have fun. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I think there's always like big projects, and if you um, and sometimes it's necessary to change like 200 files at once. But if you have created an issue in this uh, type of commits, it's really hard, and there's no easy way to answer or to to handle it. It's it's yeah, it's hard work to find the issue. Sadly. I think there's a good chance that 
chance that that merge commit? I think there's a good chance that that merge commit has two parents, not just one. So uh, there are other commits which could be run through BSEC and search for them, which are still good, and others which still fail. So normally um, you don't end up at the merge commit in a BSEC run. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Nope. Then thank you again and have a nice afternoon.